Thank you for joining us for our online program at Mechanics Institute for Once Upon a Tome, The Misadventures of a Rare Bookseller with author Oliver Darkshire in conversation with events assistant Pam Troy. If you are new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854, and we are one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, an international chess club, and ongoing author and literary programs. And Friday night, please come to our Cinema Lit Film series. Visit our website at milibrary.org for all of the things that we offer you. After our talk, uh, we'll have a Q&A with you, our audience. Also, we'd like to refer you to City Lights Bookstore for purchasing books. Well, for those of you book lovers who linger over the dust, the must, and the leather covers, you are in for a treat with Oliver Darkshire's new book, Once Upon a Tome. Today, he's going to reveal to us the mysteries and the histories of Southerns, one of the oldest bookstores located in London. And I'd like to introduce our guests. Oliver Darkshire is an antiquarian bookseller at Henry Southern Limited in London and the voice of Southern's Twitter account. He lives in Manchester, England with his husband and his neglectfully curated collection of books. And Pam Troy, who's our moderator and host today, has worked in the Mechanics Institute since 2003, managing events and helping program and run our weekly cinema lit film series. She has worked as a bookseller, a publishing assistant, a freelance writer, publishing occasional articles and short stories, and she is currently working on a fantasy novel. So please welcome a conversation with author Oliver Darkshire and Pamela Troy. Hi, thank you, Laura. So um, I think the best place to start is always at the beginning. And I wanted to ask you, Oliver, about um, how you fell into being an apprentice antiquarian bookseller. Did you, you, you the description in the book, it sound, the, in the book sounds as though you just uh, kind of walked in when you saw, uh, you saw an advertisement. Uh, could you talk about that? Were you in the habit of going into used bookstores before then or, or antiquarian bookstores? So I am, I'm firm in the belief that no one becomes an antiquarian bookseller sort of on purpose. It sort of seems to happen by accident to almost everyone. Um, I wasn't in the habit of going to you know, rare bookstores at all. I actually didn't know a difference really between an old bookstore and uh, an antiquarian one and, and, and or a secondhand bookstore. The fact there was any difference between them never went to book fairs. I, I ended up going because Southerns, the bookstore, they they made a little bit of a mistake. They were looking for an apprentice in the um, in the Dickensian sense, um, you know, to sweep chimneys and clean floors and things. Um, and the government had this, the UK government had this apprenticeship scheme under the same name they were using to train hairdressers and electricians and so on. And Southerns thought that's some free money. Um, we'll hire an apprentice. <laughs> Um, so they they went to this, they put it up on, on the government website alongside all these apprenticeships, you know, lay tracks and, you know, fixed wires and so on. And so I, I was applying to everything I could because I'm hopeless. Um, and this was one on many of my stops through the city trying to find something that would pay me. Um, and I wandered in one day, sat down. The uh, manager looked at my very short CV and said, I see you play the trombone. And that was the end of that. And he found that so funny, so inherently amusing. Um, <laughs> that I got a call the same afternoon um, with the job. So yeah, and, uh, decade later, here I am. So um, antiquarian booksellers are not necessarily born; they're made. They 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 kind of fall into the uh, into the into the profession. I think you become yeah yeah you become. So would you be willing, could you please read, uh, is there a section of the book you could read for us just to give us a taste of uh, this delightful book, which I <laughs> have read about twice now. It's uh... <laughs> oh, very nicely, so yes. Um, 
my, for my favorite section, which is about the um, which is which is about our archives. Um, it starts with the Sutherland's website, which until very recently was this kind of magnificent testament to early computing, and it was almost entirely non-functional. And sort of when you operated it, you could kind of hear the clickety clack of Babbage's ghost in the back of your mind. Um, the process for buying a book was so Byzantine that it was functionally impossible to order anything uh, without waiting several days for someone to remember to check the website for orders, and if they were feeling very generous to respond. The website actually interfered with the ability of a shop to take money from customers um, to the point where the number of sales every year was lucky to reach double figures. Um, to my mind, that anyone managed successfully to navigate it at all proved that we had some very determined customers. Uh, the pedestrian performance of the nigh unusable website was taken by proof, sort of as proof by Sutherland's, that the internet was clearly a poor way of selling books, and thus it would be foolish to invest in a better website. Um, this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy happily sustained itself for over 20 years, uh, whilst the website remained out of sight and out of mind. A large part of it was dedicated to reminding people how old Henry Sutherland Limited truly is. The year 1761 is a long way back for bookshops, which are notorious for being run to the ground by booksellers in the grip of debts, scriveners plagued by addictions, or owners who mysteriously vanish without a trace. The site described Sutherlands as the oldest bookshop in the world, which was almost but not quite the truth. When it came to making Sutherlands look prestigious and ancient, uh, my colleague James was a wellspring of creative ideas and fascinating recollections to which he was the only witness. He had a litany of things he was convinced were true about Sutherlands, which he repeated so often and with such earnest conviction that eventually everyone else started internalizing them without e ever really bothering to look into them. Was Sutherland's mentioned in a passage by Evelyn War? Yes, he assured us. Or was it Woodhouse? It changed with the wind. Did Sutherland's have a royal warrant? Yes, most assuredly, but it was lost, expired, destroyed in an accident. Historical evidence was like vintage wine to James in that he theoretically kept it in reserve for a special occasion, but no event ever seemed quite special enough to warrant deploying it. The oldest bookshop in the world motif was about as blatant a thing as he ever insisted upon, not least because we receive periodic veiled threats from a bookshop in Peru, which laid claim to the title and seemed to take our assertion as a personal insult. Regardless of the specifics, Sutherland is veiled in the kind of mystique and legend that can only be found orbiting an institution with genuinely rich heritage. As such, the website waxed lyrical to Southern history in a way that was exceedingly enticing to a certain kind of person. And no small wonder that we attracted researchers like flies to a scholarly dung heap. Many antiquarian booksellers have a deep-seated fear of well-meaning academics. University types with lots of qualifications embody the kind of thorough, diligent curiosity that a bookseller wants to keep miles away from his stock, his business, and in certain cases, his accounting. Perhaps due to James's impressive stream of confident bardic flourishes, or maybe the fact that Sutherland's labels and catalogues are found scattered across the whole of Britain, industrious scholars are constantly finding their way to our door with burning questions. Emails with the subject heading, a request, uh, nervous phone calls, and even sternly headed letters cross our threshold almost every day, asking in more or less polite tones to know the answer to some tidbit of Sutherland's law on which hinges the fate of 20 years of painstaking work. Have you a copy of the 1871 Sutherland's catalogue on Birds of Paradise, they say, or I'm investigating the life of Horace Moneybother, I do believe was a client of yours back in 1901. Do you have his purchase records? When colleges and universities are on term time, requests come faster and more frequently than genuine book orders or actual clients, and it would take several full-time posts to diligently research and answer them. As the lowly apprentice, there was a time when I attempted to engage with these requests until I started to comprehend that the emails were being passed down to me, not because anyone really expected me to deal with them, but because giving them to me meant there wasn't anyone else's desk. The important thing I eventually ascertained was that the task had been delegated, and with any luck, that would be the last anyone had to think about it. I will never forget Andrew's face as I tried to apologetically explain why I couldn't fulfill a particular project. He had himself passed to me several days earlier. 
He looked completely mystified, as if he couldn't begin to fathom why, just because he had given me a task, I'd set myself on such a noble, self-sacrificing and destructive course of inquiry as to complete it. That's, that's, um, I I think that one thing I like about your book is, is your command of language. And it, there's a particularly very British humor running through it. Um, it's, you know, combination of understatement, uh, very large vocabulary and just timing, graceful grace prose. Uh, I, one thing, a question that occurred to me when I was reading uh, your book is, how do you feel about, I know that a lot of librarians and booksellers hate, you know, say they hate it, but how do you feel about marginalia? How do you feel about uh, notes left? Do you ever have books that have extensive notes left by previous owners or? Oh, the arguments we could have over this one. Um, I've had a few. <laughs> So, I mean, as a rule of thumb, and don't quote me on this, but so the older a book is, like, the more likely you can call it marginalia and charge for it. So, <laughs> so if you have sort of a Latin primer from, I don't know, 1700, and some child has scribbled obscenities all over it because they hated Latin, which would happen thing that happened last year, that was entertaining, then that's historical context, and you can add an extra zero to the asking price. <laughs> If it's from 1980s and someone, you know, you, you don't know, had scribbled all over on the inside and we can't prove who it was, then it's more likely to be looked at as kind of undesirable damage, you know? And it's about finding the line between somebody looking at it as important context and wanting to preserve it for some reason and somebody who's just thrown ink all over the book. You know, there is a, there's a fine line. Each, each collector is going to see it differently. So we have to use our discretion to try and say that's worth something, that's damage you know um, and I guess we're the ones who make the choice a lot of the time but it's it's hazy um, personally I love it I think it adds context to any book I don't care whose notes it is I think it means that someone has cared about it enough to make you know make something of it themselves that turns it into a new object but not all collectors agree with me um, so well your book does this wonderful job of combining um, I, I almost want to say the romance associated with older books with the hard realities of selling uh, antiquarian books or selling rare books. I think one point you make is even if a book is very rare, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to sell it or that it's going to be, <laughs> yeah. you're going to be able to make money off of it. Um, but the, the point about marginalia kind of um, brings that up. I mean, personally, I'm the same way. Personally, even if something, it's something somebody wrote in about, you know, about maybe the 1970s, it's still kind of a bit of the history of the book. It tells you something about whose hands it passed through. And a lot of your stories I noticed were entertaining because they talked about that. You were talking about the personalities of the people, even if what they were selling, trying to get you was not something you could make money off of. The stories behind these collections and these people were interesting and were, were engaging. Yeah, I think it's part of what people buy into when they become book collectors in a way. Um, they're buying into the, I guess, romance is a good word for it, kind of the romance of book selling. It's what keeps customers coming in. You know, they like not only the book, but the fact that the book belonged to someone before them, that it will belong to someone probably after them as well, that they're kind of caretakers in this community of book interested people. And the booksellers are a part of that system. You know, one of the cogs that keeps the, um, the, the dream going, if you will. Um, you know, um, the industry kind of lives and dies on this idea that, that a life with books in it is, is somehow magical. Um, and that's part of what I wanted the book to be. It had to be equal parts romance and equal, you know, <laughs> which would therefore made it also realistic. Um, but that was the kind of balance we wanted to tread when, when writing it. Um, you mentioned, I mean, one of the most fascinating uh, mentions in your book is about poisoned books. <laughs> and I was, I was noticing the American the cover for the American edition of the book <laughs> looks like this. And you mention in your, in, in uh, the book that uh, one of the danger signs for especially old books from the 19th century was a bright green cover. <laughs> because <laughs> they are infused with arsenic. Yes, our little joke, it'll have to forgive us. Um, so yeah, in essence, I mean, the arsenic's the, the big one you have to keep an eye out for, and it's easy to notice because the books have this 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 bright green colour usually. 
Um, and because they're usually sort of Victorian, um, they, they, ha they haven't faded as much as red or purple. Will green doesn't fade quite as quickly. So usually quite easy to identify. If you see a brook that's bright green, you know, think again, wash your hands before eating, folks. Um, but, you know, all kinds of treacherous books come in sometimes laden with various devices people have used to stop their books decaying. They're agents which are usually not very friendly. Um, people over the years have come up with lots of chemical ideas to try and stop the cloth decaying, stop the, it's all organic, it all fades and you know, rocks. Um, most of them are just, just don't eat them. <laughs> Wash your hands after you handle your rare books, folks. Well, don't Save listen to paper before turning a page, maybe. <laughs> just, you know. In the name um, of the road. It's a terrible idea. Um, so yeah, we, we get our fair share of um, um, poison books in. I have a little bookmark somewhere from, um, somebody came and left it with me that has little grades of green and says poison, not poison, which is quite fun. Um, get your hands on one of those. Well, that's that's fascinating. And then one of the things I noticed in, in your book also is you have these wonderful illustrations, often of non-book items <laughs> yeah. that have been brought in, particularly gourds. That was that was very that, that was especially fascinating. Oh, gourds. Are there are there some non-book items you didn't mention in your book that people have brought in and somehow lumbered you with and 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 left left behind? Gosh, people are leaving stuff all the time. They just shed things. Um, broken umbrellas. They have uh, people love to come in and leave broken umbrellas with us, and then people will steal the broken umbrellas, thinking they're not broken. So there's a cycle of life going on. <laughs> um, gosh, there's lots of stores. There's a chair with a big hole in it that we keep for aesthetic purposes, and people keep trying to sit on it, and we have to kind of run over and say, "Don't sit in it. It will. You know, it's a death trap." Um. Mostly broken things that have just circled down to us and kind of found, found a home. We have a big press that we, we squash books in when they've been fixed or refurbished or whatever, or if they, if they go a funny, funny shape in the sun. We have a great big, like, massive iron press thing that we just screw down to keep the force it back into shape. That's fun. Um, but lots of things hanging around that bookstore. So um, I, my understanding is that you are not, present at Sutherland's as much as you were but you were you are now you're living in Manchester now yeah these days and I'm a bit like their friendly ghost um, you're their you're friendly ghost have you had any adventures since then with used books I mean with antiquarian <laughs> so I when I moved up there I thought I'll I'll go to the local bookstores I'll make some friends you know I'll get out of the house I've been in the house for two years I'll go to the local bookstores so I left the house to try and find some bookstores and found that most of them were phantasms. Um, they had websites, but no physical premises, or they were an attic that never opened. Or, And I was reaching the end of my tether when I decided I would go to um, a colleague's bookstore and said, this one's got a good website. They're still selling stuff. They have to be there. I went two hours out of my way um, to find that there was a crater with a bookstore. <laughs> I should have been <laughs> literally a crater. I don't know what happened to it, what where it went, why someone decided to evict the entire bookstore and its foundation out of the ground and some time in the last 20, 12 years, but something something happened to that bookstore and I will find out. Um, well, that's 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 a pity. I mean, that's kind of a sad story. It is, isn't <laughs> it? Where did it all go? Where? Like, how would you move all that stuff? I have a lot of questions. Well, I, well, brick and mortar bookstores, there are a lot of them, you know, are disappearing, sadly. Um, which kind of brings me when you know about something that occurs to me about one useful purpose antiquarian and even used bookstores serve and that is just the solidity of books let's talk about for a minute the solidity of a book with pages as opposed to reading something on a kindle or reading something written in light on a screen um there's something you know i would call it textual integrity you know if I go, for instance, into a, um, an archive of magazines and I open uh, a bound set of Time magazine from the 1930s, I am looking at exactly what a 1930s reader looked at. And I am not always positive about that if I'm reading something online in an online archive. I think that, I mean, do you, do you feel that um, used and antiquarian bookstores serve a certain purposes uh, as far as preser preserving? books in their original the, the text not just books but the text in its original form yeah i think i'd agree i mean i when when they mooted of the internet as an idea not that long ago um part of the you know attraction to it was that we would have this eternal record of everything 
um, not really realizing that, of course, the internet largely relies yeah. on having physical disk space to store things on. Somebody has to host it. And if you are a library, for instance, digitizing things or an archive, keeping it, someone has to pay for that storage, that space. And not only that, but it's very easy to alter in a way that, you know, forging um, a rare book isn't. Like, it's much more difficult to make forgeries and alterations to a physical book. Um, so I think I'd, I'd agree on that. And conversely, strangely, actually, the physical record is more reliable than that. <laughs> Then the, um, it's a bit like um, with our, with our security at Southern Runs, the most precious things. We don't put them behind the electronic lock, put them in a great big safe. But no one knows how to pick a big lock anymore. Um, people could easily get in past you know, our electronic sensors or past the Wi Fi security, I guess they really wanted to. But the really important things lock them in a great big box with a key because no one's learning how to pick a lock anymore. Um, and I feel it's a similar deal. Like, you know, a lot of people have invested heavily into you know, online shenanigans, um, leaving, you know, physical world japes behind um and i feel like that's important to recognize so one of the things that um it, another thing that's occurred to me is as time goes on uh obviously the concept of an antiquarian book or even a rare book is going to change and one of my questions had to be has to do with mass market paperbacks which kind of flooded the market um in the in the 70s and 80s and a lot of those are left. Um, do you foresee them becoming, are there rare editions? I know that there are some pulp novels are rare editions, but do you see mass markets becoming at some point uh, a rarity? Not only because uh, sometimes that's the only edition of a book, but because they're rather ephemeral physically. They can, they fall apart quickly. It's really tricky. Um, I've thought about this. You know, my colleague and I work in literature. You know, we we talk about this a lot when we're out buying books and we're deciding what to pick up and what to save and what to what to put a price on and say this is valuable. You know, um, and the fragility of it is it's important because, as you say, there aren't that many left after a while. Even even with the best will in the world, paperbacks fall apart as soon as you look at them. Um, when you get to 30 or 40 years, they become really fragile, particularly if the paper's not very good quality, um, and they all vanish. But the collectors, for the most part, they ask us for hardbacks, usually. So we're in this strange place where we're buying the things that we think will make money. So we buy the you know, hardback first edition. Then in the meantime, the paperbacks quietly fritter away and, you know, are in boxes somewhere, and then it might never be seen again. So I think in time, you know, paperbacks are sometimes harder to find than the hardbacks, particularly the farther back you go. Um, it probably depends on your genre as well and publishing history sometimes. You know, if the book was published in paperback first, obviously we, it's easier to justify putting it on the shelves and saying to a collector it was actually the first printing. So despite the fact it's paperback, we find ourselves apologizing for paperbacks a lot. You know, it's a paperback, but, you know, um, it's really important for these reasons. Um, I wonder if the wind will change one day and people will say, actually, the paperback's a lot more difficult to <laughs> retrieve now, so we're interested. Mm. Well, I, th I think you obviously, for anyone looking at the shelf behind you knows you love reading. <laughs> so many. Is there a particular genre of, of fiction or nonfiction you're especially fond of? And are there particular rare, rare books you would like to collect? Um, I'm a big fantasy reader. So so my shelves are everything from Le Guin down to Pratchett through to Strange and Mr. Norrell, you know. Um, so there are, I love my role-playing books, game books at the bottom, my big shelf at the bottom is full of you know, dice games and everything, goblins and ghouls. Um, and kind of thematically, oddly, I, rare books-wise, I have this kind of little growing collection of, of English folklore from about the 1800, late 1800s. It was this fascinating period where they were walking around the country trying to save all these stories and legends. Um, from like There was a good like 50, 60 years where they, people, they were doing that and binding all the books together. So I've, I've been looking for those. So yeah, it's mostly creepies, crawlies, and... Um, and ghouls. Well, speaking of, of rare books, I can see some of the old role playing game, um, particularly like Chaosium, uh, Lovecraft role playing games becoming at some point prized, prized possessions. I mean, they're again, they're kind of an ephemera in their own. And yeah, this is my hunch, but firstly, because I mean, if you look, I mean, I was buying books for Sutherlands the other day and I picked up um, a Dungeons and Dragons monster manual or two because. People played with them, firstly, and kids got their hands on them. Anyone who collects children's books will know that there's nothing that will destroy aerobic faster than you know, doing it what it was supposed to do and giving it to a child to read, you know? No, they get destroyed pretty quickly. In addition to which, um, you know, game books, you know, people, they're printed in small print runs, usually. 
even today, like most game books are printed in red, so there's more print runs. So a combination of those two things means that, you know, good copies of those are quite hard to find already, let alone in 50 years. Now, we have um, an antiquarian book fair and art book fair here in San the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, in England, if we were visiting, if, you know, if some of us were to go visit England, are there particular antiquarian books or um, book fairs you'd recommend uh, paying a visit to? Yeah, so um, the main one I think is coming up in, in May, which is called Firsts at the moment, and that's the uh, one done by the Antiquarian Bookstore Association. It's their big flagship fair. They hold that in London at the moment in the Saatchi Gallery, I think, which is quite good. Um, and that's where all the kind of booksellers in London get together in a room and hawk things at each other. Um, but there's usually one in York at one point, which is a bit more, um, York's the other big bookselling town in England where the, all the booksellers come from originally. Um, and that's a bit more, a bit quieter. Um, you can find more interesting things there, I tend to think, personally. So my bit would usually be York. But um, yeah, you gotta watch the calendar for those because they don't always, you have to dig around for the information because they don't always publicize them <laughs> very well. How did Southerns change from the time you um, you started working there and to the time when you you moved to Manchester? And especially how has how has COVID, the shutdown, changed Southerns? Gosh, I mean, I think they found COVID quite peaceful. Um, there was no one bothering <laughs> them for anything. There were no emails coming in. <laughs> in some ways, it was a delight, um, apart from obviously the plague. Uh, but the plague notwithstanding. Um, it was quite quiet. Um, even since I joined, that they've been doing various works. They're always doing works in Sutherlands. Ever since they moved in, they've been losing floors, gaining staircases. Um, I still don't know what the hatch in the ceiling does. It goes somewhere. I just I can't prove why. Nobody wants to investigate because then it's their job to deal with it. So we kind of leave it. Um, and there's very you know we, we we took shelves apart to try and find found things that have been hidden there for who knows how long. Been stuffed there by colleagues that are you know, long dead. So we did some rooting about to find things and just found more questions and answers and put it all back. So it was fun, um, not very productive. Well, it was, um, I mean, in the building you're in, how, how old again is the building? I know that you, they've been, that Southern's only been in that building relatively, you know, not Since, relatively <laughs> recent, but how old is that building? So that, well? the, the, Southern was the first tenants in that building. It was put up in the 1930s, I think um they moved around london a bit before that hopping skipping jumping they were promised it was going to be this grand redeveloped so like shopping hub and so they moved in like the gullible fools we all are and then they, nobody else moved in so it's been a desolate wasteland ever since um and so they've been stuck there since the 1930s in the basement they had the mezzanine floor at one point but then we moved out um because of some tragedy that no one will explain to me something bad happened i don't know what it was they moved out the mezzanine so now we have the grand floor and the basement cellars um, which is where we currently hide everything that we don't want to think about. Well, Sackville Street, I mean, it's on Sackville Street, correct? Yeah, that's a, Sackville Street. That's a great name for a street, I always think. Well, it's 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 very, very old. I, I mean, it's, it's I, I actually looked up the name Sackville to see if it was it was any relation <laughs> to Sackville West or anything like that. But no, it's a ship captain or something. It's a, so it's not the it's it's not an area it's an old neighborhood but it's not one that's been been cared for judging from what you're, you're not saying. particularly they keep trying to revitalize it by um and the one trick they have for this the council and they keep trying to do it is, is by changing the traffic direction that's their trick and every few years they'll do it and the traffic is so confused at this point the cars just ram into it end up halfway down it which you know doesn't solve the problem at all it's just a confusion of parked cars in the wrong places. But every few years they'll 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 say we're 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 revitalizing the street. We're going to change the traffic direction again. <laughs> so they try, not very hard, but they try. How um can you talk about some of your? I, I, is there are there customers that you didn't mention who you think would like be some or something from a book or something from a novel that you would. Gosh, so when I was putting the book together, one of the things I didn't want to do was. You know pull out a particular customer and make fun of them or anything that didn't seem fair or right because you know i work with them a lot and most of them are very nice and we get along so what we did was we kind of chimera the traits from various people together into you know archetypes the kind of people that we find in southern so we didn't have to apart from one entity who i will not name who i basically pulled straight from real life into the book and um the other day i, I got a text from rebecca who works with me in literature and it was just he knows in full caps <laughs> Um, and I haven't been back since, so um, I will not be naming any other. <laughs> I've learned from my mistake. 
Were you worried about offending? I mean, when you were, you're also, you, you do write about your coworkers. I mean, were you, were you concerned about, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure that's walking a very delicate line. You have to, even, even with the best of intentions, you want to make sure you don't, I mean. Yeah, they were, I was, I was really worried. Now, the first thing I did was take the, you know, proposal or you know, part of the draft I'd written into the manager, Chris, who wrote the forward for me and said, I, right, this is what I'm thinking of doing how do I do this? You know, is this all right if I do this? Is it, is it going to cause problems? Um, and he was exceptionally good. And he you know, helped me you know, re rewrite it and you know, helped me draft certain chapters that I thought were problems you know, and you know, told me which bits that he thought were going to be issues. Um, he, you know, he did really help me edit it and craft it. And all my colleagues, I showed them the bit before I published it and said, this is you. Tell me if this is offensive with a pen. And they went through it with a line and said, I like this or I don't like this. Or put a footnote here. Um, they were all they were all really supportive, and honestly, I was I was surprised because if someone said to me, "I'm going to write a book about you and your work," I would have told them to jog on, um, get out of my face, and never darken my doorstep again. So they were <laughs> they were really supportive. Um, they have been all the way through. Would you consider offering another short reading? I, I could do. I don't have anything prepared. Well, um, um, I was going to ask you also. You know, you mentioned that there are ghosts. That there's a there's an issue that. <laughs> you mentioned ghosts and you mentioned them in terms of uh them existing not them might maybe existing you seem to you at least come across as though you believe in them that the, the place is haunted well i mean on, on some level you work in a bookstore as other ones long enough and you just kind of accept it because there's if you lock a case with your own two hands <laughs> and it's right you know it's right at the top nothing's touching it there's no wind in the bookstore and it opens itself and throws a book at you after a while you just sort of accept the fact that either you're going crazy or there's a ghost and simplest Occam's razor the simplest explanation is the books are haunted um so <laughs> that is what I have gone with I refuse to investigate or interrogate any more than that um it is what it is um but they've been better since we moved the portraits around so it's, you know so the sub, you, you think that it was the um the original owner who is who is Possibly, yeah. But I think it was the last Southern who was killed um, crossing Piccadilly by a tram. Um, I think he was annoyed by the indignity of that, I think. Um, <laughs> rank with him. I, I have a suspicion, but um, it, it varies depending on which member of staff you ask. They're, all the Southerns are a bit odd, so it really could be any of them. Um, my bet is it's one of those. Um, but um, they're relative, for ghosts, they're relatively benign. Rattling pipes and throwing books and things, so you learn to live with it. Well, I should think books kind of invite, uh, the, at least the, the the being in an area filled with old books would kind of invite either the perception of it being haunted, or if 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 ghosts exist, it would be <laughs> definitely a place to be haunted, especially if the both ghosts were books book lovers. If they're lurking anywhere, <laughs> then they're lurking in an old bookstore. There are lots of lots of new people to meet every day, I suppose, um, and you know things to rattle and stuff to read I suppose who knows but I think people people almost expect it and after a while you just sort of learn to learn to accept it I think have any of your um your customers been troubled by a ghost or is it strictly the people who work there um I mean we go to a lot of odd places to pick up books um some of which um, I went to an, um, a, a lady's house who had who had, whose attic was filled entirely with portraits she's painted of her dead husband <laughs> um they were just hanging in rows in the ceiling i had to duck on she was like the books are in there somewhere and i'm like i know they're in <laughs> i'm not worried about the books i'm worried about the haunted paintings um uh, so we go to all sorts of strange places looking for books and the odder the place the better the books usually so um very possible how has southerns survived financially I mean, it's. I know that you say it's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, you know, the, how you, you. One of the things you bring out is how it's catch and catch can, old, rare book selling is. But Southerns has been around for about you know, more than one century. How does it? How does that? How do you account for that? So my running joke, which I'm not allowed to make anymore, is that Southerns has been one year away from closing since 1761. And I say it every year, I'm like, we're about to close every year, and it never does. Um, so it, it, it depends. And at various points in its history, it's been doing incredibly well. And then, you know, the tides change. Everything goes, you know, hell for 
everything goes to hell and the bookstore is desperate for money again. And then suddenly it has some again. I mean, at various points, it's been supported by what's the word people use? Philanthropists um, who have you know put money into the bookstore you know, and then regretted it. Um, I think there's a certain uh, various other bookstores in London have, a, have the same story in a way. Like a lot of times, booksellers are bought by people who want to run a bookstore or like the idea of owning a bookstore and accept the fact that they're not always going to be massive money making machines that sometimes you're providing something to a community or you're you know i don't know you're funding an institution i guess during a time when it's a little rough for it and then sometimes the bookstore makes a lot of money every 10 years it's strange the tides come and go and sutherland's have just been quite lucky i feel a lot of bookstores have been not quite so lucky have not quite you know as many patrons or have just you know made one bad decision that can turn the whole thing over i i think this other one's just been yeah it's i mean it owned by a bunch of people who make good decisions at the time bad decisions at other times and then been lucky at other points that's all the, i suppose all, it sounds bad to say it's all luck but i think that's a big part of it um do you um i'm, I'm trying to frame this the, the it seems to me that people have been predicting the end of reading ever since i <laughs> They said it, you know, when when movies, when radio, when TV, and then now the internet. Um, what my observation is that people, bookstores still, they may not, they they may struggle, but I'm always, I always see people in bookstores. I mean, do you think? Are you optimistic about the future of of bookstores? Is it is it that um, do you think reading will shift entirely to online or to Kindle or I mean, as you say, people have been predicting the end of reading since uh, who knows when, since they invented the book, haven't they? And since the wax tablet, they've been saying people will stop doing this at some point. Um, and I just don't think that's true. I think there's something material to um, the book. I just, it's about that physicality we mentioned earlier that makes it unique in forms of, you know, uh, literary pastimes. I mean, if you spend all the day looking at your phone, a book is an escape from that, you know, um, in a way that... <laughs> other kinds of, you know, um, watching films and so on isn't necessarily. I'm looking at a screen all day and the book is a way to put that down for five seconds. And I think even people younger than me are exhausted sometimes by being looking at a screen all day. Like everything I do is online. I work online, you know, I rec my recreation's online, I socialize online and a book is a way to escape escapism without having to do that, <laughs> without having to resort back to my screen, which invades every other aspect of my life. Um, so yeah, I, th I think they're really good. I think people will stick with them because um, they, you know, the, the technology is everywhere else. No, it doesn't need to be in my recreation too. It doesn't need to be my my personal time too. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I don't think we need to worry. And we've got questions from the audience, so we could uh, have Alyssa read out a few of the questions to engage our our audience as well. You're muted, Sorry. Alyssa, you're muted. All right, ready to roll. Our first question comes from Michelle Anderson from our chat. How antique does an antiquarian book have to be? Oh, okay, so we argue about that in the store all the time, we're pleased to hear. Um, some people will insist that it's, you know, if it's, they'll have a hard line in the sand, they'll say, if it's not before 1950, I'm not interested. Um, and the general line is that, you know, antique thing is over 100 years old, but people won't always stick to that. And we have books in other ones from the, the 80s, 90s, you know, sometimes even relatively recent things, if we think they're notable. The trick is to call it rare and antiquarian bookselling so that you can do whatever you want. Um, <laughs> and no one can shake their fist at you. But when the general bar is that, you know, 100 years is an antique, but you'll find people breaking that rule all the time as long as it interests them, really. Our next question is from Laura, and you've covered a small part of this, but I, I think it's an interesting piece of, of history of the bookstore. How has the bookstore changed over the years in terms of ownership or focus? Shakespeare and Co. in Paris changed location and now has new young ownership. How has that been for Southerns? So Southerns, it, start, it actually started off in York. I mentioned earlier, York is the other big book selling city in, in England, really. Um, and it moved after some scandal. Again, we, we lost the details of. Um, and after that scandal, it moved to London and set up a new premises, which became the 
the big store and it moved premises all the time. So it started and it had a, one in the Strand, it had one in Piccadilly. Um, and it was only, only by the 1930s, actually, it settled down in Sackville Street. Um, so it had various different premises, all owned by the Sutherlands, um, this family of booksellers who had nephews and cousins, all of which eventually became booksellers. It was a lineage of booksellers, really. You'll find that with a lot of London bookstores. You know, they're owned by families, Mags, Quaritch, and so on. They're owned by dynasties of booksellers. Um, and only when the last Sutherland died in a tragic accident before having an heir did it pass on to, I, I think it was bought, it was saved by one of these wealthy philanthropists that wanted this bookstore to continue, knowing that bookstores vanish so easily. Um, and then it's been owned by various people down the down the years until the present powers that be, um, who, we don't, who we do not discuss in a shadowy form, um, uh, currently keep currently own it and keep it going but yeah it, it's after the Sutherlands um that was mid 20th century I think a lot Sutherland died it's been owned by various people since then keeping it in the same place sort of a institution um but it is it's fact there's a, there's a book on it by um, by Victor Gray called Bookman which is about the history of Sutherlands which I mean it, it's a struggle in places but <laughs> it, it does have some very interesting facts in it um, he was a historian that did some, he did it for 2012, I think it was published. Um, so if you want to look into Bookman by Victor Gray, it's quite a good, quite a good read if you're willing to get to the end. Sort of, it gets very dramatic in the last 50 years. Our next question is from Sheila Cunningham, and it's uh, about demographics of the guests of the bookstore. Um, do you have any traction with younger readers? Some of the um, maybe people in their teens, 20s, 30s? I mean, increasingly we do, and I think it's to do with that that collector's kind of <laughs> impulse. In every generation, there are a bunch of people um, who like to collect nice things and put them in a row. And I don't know whether, um, you know, we're always saying we need to reach out to new demographics and so on. But I think they just grow with time. I think every, you know, by the time they have, uh, some, some of my colleagues like to say that, but you know, by the time they have money, they're ready to put their collection together. <laughs> But you often see people mooching about of all kind of ages and Sutherlands, really. Um, you have you have people dragging their parents in by the hand to the, you know, they want to look at the shiny books, you know, of every different age shot of those people, but only at a certain point do they have the money to realize that collecting can be expensive, you know. Um, but we do see them milling around, sort of waiting in the wings, ready to swoop in. So they are there. I I do have a question. Do you um is there has there ever been a book that came into Sutherlands that you wanted? Gosh. Well, I mean, one of the privileges of being a bookseller is that you can swipe things um, before they hit the shelves, <laughs> which we routinely do. Um, gosh, there was... Yeah, hold on. So this came, copy of the Stella Almanac came in, um, which is one of my favourites, um, which is a publication um, uh, by P. Scott Hollander. Um, and it basically, she she wrote like an entire manual, a tour guide to hell. Um, and it was published in, I don't know, what, I don't know, two copies or something. Um, and nobody had ever you know, heard of it. And it was, it's, it's completely mad. Um, but I looked at it and I fell in love with it. And I was like, I'm swiping this before it hits the shelves. I'm paying a reasonable amount for this. And then it's coming home with me. Um, and I've seen, I've, I, honestly, I haven't seen another one since and I've looked just in case I get a second copy for someone else people ask me to but um, I've never seen that one so I'm glad I did but yeah um books are a privilege you swipe things before they before they catch the shelves if you need to um we have a question does your shop do restoration work on books uh, which needs spine or cover repairs. I mean, you were talking about that big machine, the, the press, but <laughs> tell us about some of the rest restorative work that that that's done there. So we have, and we don't have a restorer per se. We have what's called a furbisher, um, who is a little chap called Stephen, who is a magician, um, and he works dark arts under the stairs. And when I give him a book, he's a little sorry. And when it returns, the sorry has gone away. And I don't ask questions. Um, because <laughs> I don't want to know. He does a little. He he kind of he did you know, removes the dirt as best he can. You know he uh, uh, I want to say tarts it up, but he sort of you know he, he, he puts a cover on it. He stops the moves the dust away. Um, you know he does it, everything he can to make it look as best it can without actually altering the book itself. Um, and a restorer would probably do a lot more. Uh, they 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 don't want tools a lot more involved. They have a whole workshop. We don't have a workshop in the store. 
Um, but we we do we can do things that like we can correct the you know um, uh, if if it's, if a if a book is warped or cox and we can sometimes fix that little things uh, to make sure that you know it's not getting any more damage while it's with us. Um, and then once you pass it off, it's you know it's someone else's business how they store it. Um, but yeah, full restoration. There are books to one uh, shepherds in, in London does really good restoration. They have a whole department for that, um, and they're fabulous. Um, they've done work miracles in the past, so um, you'll often find that restorers and bookbinders work quite closely together. Um, not always within bookstores. Uh, we just have a a comment and a question from John. A few decades ago, before the internet, I was delighted to visit Hay on Wye in Wales. It was a marvelous village and antiquarian bookstore center. Do you know if it still has such a it has such a place and uh, or was it killed by the internet? Um, I hear it is still fabulous. I've never been, um, to my great shame, regret. I haven't had the chance. Um, but I hear it, it's still a, it's still a wonderful place to visit. Yeah, I hear it's a great trip. Um, I've meaning to now that I'm more freer in my travels. Um, one of my things on my list to do is go down there and spend a weekend and call it work. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's the plan. All right, we have another restoration question. Any tips on how to remove odors from old books? Oh gosh, yeah, yeah um, um, sort of a, a what do we call them? Close pegs for the notes are great; they work wonders. Um, so you just or a different room also great. With the odors, it's tricky because once pages have absorbed the the smell, there's not much. It's a bit like foxing on books. You know, you can remove it, but it makes the problem worse. So a lot, a lot of the stuff you would do to remove odors from paper is going to damage the paper to a point where it wouldn't, you know, at that point, you're just, you know, you might as well throw it in the blender. Um, it's very difficult, honestly. I mean, you can remove the odor from the room, you know, in the conventional ways, and that probably helps. But honestly, once the smell's gotten a book, particularly the cloth or the paper, any removing of it, and at least that I know how to do, um, would probably be better, worse than the, the solution would be worse than the living as it is I'm honest um, Oliver I wanted to ask about the uh, the London book fair which is one of the largest international book fairs if if you attend book fairs yourself like that particular one and if they have an antiquarian section in the book fair I think it's coming so, up soon yes yeah, so the, 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 the London Antiquarian book fair which they now call first um is held is which is currently being held in the in the Saatchi gallery um that's the when I sometimes go to that um more when I was made to under duress I'm not very good at book fairs um a lot standing around talking to people and that's not my not my forte um but we do sometimes have a stand at those things um because it's good to buy and sell from other booksellers as well it's a good chance to catch up with everyone in the trade and mooch around and um say hello I suppose socializing is a big part of it <laughs> um and booksellers swap a lot of books there as well so it's not only meeting customers it's also touching base with everyone else in the Trade, which is a good idea if you want to make friends and influence people and so on. Um, so yeah, we're, we're often at that. Um, and there's another one in Chelsea in London, which is in the autumn usually, which is great at the Chelsea Town Hall, which is fabulous. Again, a lot of the same people go, but it's the principle of the thing, you know. Get out of the house, air the books a little. That's how it is. Uh, good for the soul. Yeah. yeah, the book, the book fair industry. Uh, well, of course, for over twenty years, the uh, uh, America Book Association and also uh, the BEA Books America used to have a, a wonderful, huge book fair at the Javits Center in New York and in different locations, but that's closed down. Uh, mm. But I, I, I attended for over 20 years, which was incredible. It was an incredible experience. And it also had international, you know, the royalties and media and eBooks and it had so much going on in one location. Book Expo America, that was a title. Um, anyway, any other questions from the audience? Uh, anyone want to pose a question to Oliver across the pond? Um, uh, Michelle has one. Um, she's asking about a book fair in Jaipur. Honestly, I don't know anything that happens outside my house most of the time, <laughs> let alone outside the country. So I honestly, I couldn't. <laughs> I barely know what goes on in my own backyard which, you know, is a mess, by the way. Um, so I honestly, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, I said, I, I, I kind of vaguely keep track of the ones here. Sometimes in the north of England now, I try and keep an ear out and eye out for them. But um, once you get across the channel, I'm useless. Hopeless is the word. There is a suggestion um, from uh, Alan Rodman. 
freezing will stop pests and place enclosed container of kitty litter with diatomaceous earth to dry and deodorize books. Does that sound right to you? Does that sound like a good suggestion? I couldn't speculate. Um, it may <laughs> well work, but I don't want to recommend it and have someone's book turn into a cat or something. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it may well do. Um, people have their own various home remedies and things, which sometimes do work, but um, I'll, I'll admit, so we haven't found anything that works consistently for all you know, very books of various ages are all made from different things. They require different treatment, and that's part of the problem. So what works for one collection might may well work for the whole thing and may well not work for other ones. So we tend to not recommend it purely because we don't know what someone's collection is going to compose of. And you know, a little ephemera, box of ephemera sort of pamphlets and things that are quite fragile might not withstand the same punishment as a big leather-bound thing. So it, you know, depends. Your mileage may vary. We have a question. Has Southerns been featured in any television shows or films, either as a real store or as a fictionalized shop or a backdrop or setting? I mean, people, we get requests from film crews all the time. Can we film in your bookstore? And the answer is no, that's an inconvenience. Because um, <laughs> what they usually want is for us to remove all the bookshelves and then replace them with setting appropriate books for their particular movie and I'm like that's like three days of work for like literally no book sales um so we don't often do that I'll admit um and it's, it's, it's a massive hassle as Andrew used to say um so we don't often uh, people because people don't really know Sutherland exists we don't really feature in our own right either so we're blissfully under the radar most of the time um it's quite nice actually uh another question uh, we have a question from Denise uh do you have correspondence across the way in Ireland De Burka rare books I mean, various, so my colleagues love to keep their secrets and they all have various contacts, some of which I know for a factor in Ireland, but they won't always disclose them to me. <laughs> they all have their various trusted sellers they require, you know, who they source things from. Um, not many trips made, I don't think, but I, I happen to know uh, they have some contacts which I'm not yet privy to. Um, and there are various, their file effects of, you know, um, various interested booksellers and so on. There's a lot of trade going on on the surface. One of these days, I'll find out. Um, of course, we just passed, you know, the, the 100th anniversary of uh, the publishing of Ulysses by James Joyce. Uh, has James Joyce ever come into the bookstore? And do you have any signed copies by him? Gosh, there's this, um, there's this fabulous example, which is probably quite well known, that we get in sometimes, um, which was it's an illustrated version of Ulysses. Have you heard of it? Um, and who was it that did the illustrations for it and got them completely? Who didn't? Who didn't read it? I forget now. Was it um the, the recent the recent publication? It was it was it was the little while back. Um, I don't remember if he did illustrations now. Hold yeah, on, was it, it was it the oh, Italian yeah. illustrator, the one that came up from? It was with the Italian illustrator. Hold on, we I'm have it here, but I don't notes. have it in front of me. Let's see. It sounds familiar, Oliver, because I think it sounds like we, we do a big Ulysses event every year. And I think I know what you're, I wish I could remember the name yes, of it. Yes, it's, it's iconic. And I can't remember who the wretched illustrator is. They're really They're famous. They're very avant-garde. They're very- um, Yes, I mean, yeah. they gave this, the publisher gave this um, copy of Ulysses, the illustrator, who thought that it was about Troy or something. So they did a bunch of illustrations without reading it. Um, and then sent it back. And because they, the illustration was so expensive, they ended up publishing it because they had to. They ended with the wrong illustrations. So it's uh, silly. I can't remember the name. I, it'll, it'll come to me later. But um, it, we get that in a lot because it's so funny. Like this, this copy of Ulysses knocking about with all the wrong illustrations in, I think. Um, that's the right That's the right one. I'll see if I can find it while we're talking. Well, in the meantime, do you have other books that are signed that are quite celebrity authors? That of note that you'd like to mention to us? Oh, we do, we do sometimes. They, we, they come, we get them as often at sign books as often as we can because they're more popular. Um, we had um, Orwell a little while back, sort of um, homage to Catalonia. Um, that was quite good. That's quite rare signed by him. Um, Fleming, we try and get what we can because that's quite valuable still. People love James Bond and they, you know, they seem to, I think it's the covers they go for really, but um, if we can find signed versions of that, they're worth the you know, King's Ransom. 
But um, modern first a lot, yeah. So anything from the late 20th century, early 20th century, you know, if we can find some copies of those, which, you know, it's not as doable. Um, we get hold of them where we can. Though, you know, increasingly difficult, you know, in today's market. But Do you get, is there a market for errata? For like, for books that have um, misprints, things like that. I know that the, in their Bibles, you know, there are famous examples of Bibles, like the, the adulterous Bible, where it says thou shalt commit adultery in terms of a misprint. <laughs> That's right, yeah. I, I wonder, I mean, we don't see a lot of them. No, well, not that I'm marked that way. I mean, a lot of the, you know, um, famous books are famous because they've got the, so if we, if we take Fleming, for instance, in particular, we, we had this, there's a massive bibliography published a little while ago, which was huge with all the Fleming books inside it. And you can basically identify which one was first by the various mistakes that were made. And that's generally how it's done, you know. Oh, it's a first edition because it's got an M on page seven, you know. Um, so it's not necessarily because it's an errata so much as because you can use the mistakes to identify what order things were done in. Um, particularly if they cut their editions all look very similar and someone forgot to date them, which happens more often than, <laughs> than you'd like to think. Um, but yeah, so they're important, uh, but often for identifying them really um, it helps us track, keep track of the various editions and printings, you know, if it happened a lot at once and it's a very popular book. Um, so it's worth knowing. Uh, a lot of bibliographies on the shelves to keep track of it. Thank you. Well, you know, we've come to the end of our hour, and I want to thank Oliver Darkshire, author of Once Upon a Tome, The Misadventures of a Rare Bookseller. We're so pleased that you could join us from Manchester, and I hope for those of you who are traveling to London, you will check out Southern's um, on Sackville Street. Uh, also, thanks to Pam Troy, our host and moderator today, our events assistant and cinema lit film curator here at Mechanics Institute. Please check our website out at milibrary.org for our author events, for our book clubs, writers groups, and all the things that we offer here. We have our chess club, chess tournaments, and our beautiful library. And once again, we want to thank both of you uh, for a great conversation. Thank you, book lovers, for joining us. And come back again for our next program.